Imran. So colleagues, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a statement uh, effectively that went out to every student and every staff member uh, about 40, for half an hour or 45 minutes ago. Uh, the, the statement itself is really a product of uh, a decision that was made in the early hours of this morning. As you well know, since Tuesday, we've had uh, mediators uh, in the form of previous presidents of the Black Student Society in the SRC, a number of them, Tiercho Mosaneke, Dali Mpofu, Sipo Maseku, many of the others. A list of them have been trying to mediate a resolution to the challenges that WITS and probably higher education has been confronting. Uh, and they've been trying to mediate a settlement between the university and the protesting students. Last week, you know that we had a poll, and the vast majority of students and staff wanted to return uh, to, the, to the academic program of 2016. And the management has been spending hours and days to try and get the academic program on track. It is our singular focus to get the academic program on track. And the reason is that we believe that while the struggle for free education is a noble struggle, it does not require the sacrifice of the 2016 academic program. And so we spent effectively the last couple of days to try and see if we could find a solution to this. Last week, in, uh, last weekend, we decided to open in a phased opening on Monday and Tuesday. On Saturday, we released a statement to every member of the university community that said we are committed to free education for the poor and the missing middle, that we were committed to a general assembly, that we were committed to work, working with the students, but that we wanted the resumption of the academic program. We agreed to a phased opening on Monday with, with simply staff returning, on Tuesday with lectures, returning on Tuesday, we couldn't guarantee. On Monday, what had happened, when we kept the police at the periphery, staff and, uh, staff and other students were harassed uh, and intimidated. And therefore, on Tuesday, we brought in police uh, on, uh, on site. And then you saw, uh, in the course of the day, while things succeeded in the morning between 8 and 10 o'clock, after 10, it became a very, very difficult situation. And you saw this live the tear gas, the stun grenades, and the demonstrations that took place, and the fact that we lost the program. In the course of that day, the mediators came to us and suggested they think they have a solution. If we suspend the academic program for the following week, if we declare support for the idea of a general assembly, that we would be able to resume on Monday, uh, Monday, uh, the 10th of, or the 10th, the, uh, is it the 10th? The 10th of October. And effectively, that was the plan. And even though it was very difficult and we were going to lose another three days, we decided to effectively make one last push because we felt that opening under a negotiated outcome without police, without all of the overt security, would be in the best interest of this institution, of all of its students, of all of its staff, and it would be in the best interest of the country as a whole in the higher education system. So we gave it one more try. And over the last couple of days, we've been party to a series of negotiations facilitated 
by the mediators themselves. Those negotiations went on and the mediators left home at half past three this morning. After half past three, or at three o'clock this morning, we have had a series of engagements, telephone calls, etc., and then a meeting that resolved how we, how we go forward. And do we have the General Assembly, do we have the march, and will we open on, on Monday? And effectively, that meeting decided on the following statement, uh, which went out, as I said, 30, 45 minutes ago to the university community and has gone out to you as, as, as the press itself. So I'm going to read that statement. I also am going to follow up to read the pledge that we were willing to commit to so you understand how far the university community went to try and find a solution to this challenge. That pledge was broadly supported by our council and it was supported effectively by our Senate. And that's a significant statement. When a university Senate and its council puts its entire energy behind a statement, as significant as this, uh, it is a dramatic statement to make. We had also committed to having a General Assembly, and we had committed to doing a march to the Constitutional Court that would, in, would, would affirm to the world what BITS as a community was prepared to put forward. But despite all of those massive concessions, we still did not get enough from the protesters themselves. And so yes, I will read it first, as I said, the decision we made about an hour ago, and then I will read the university pledge so you understand how far the university community was prepared to go in this regard. So here's the decision we made and the message we sent to everybody else. Dear colleagues, it is with deep regret that we announced the postponement of the General Assembly that was to be held today. This week, we suspended the academic program and dedicated all our resources towards building a consensus within the university community in order to be able to resume the academic program on Monday. We had reached consensus with all university constituencies, including the council, the senate, the convocation, labor and staff, but not with the protesting students. Despite all our attempts, and the energetic engagement of former Black Student Society and SRC leaders. The mediation process with the protesting students was unsuccessful. A congregation of the General Assembly is only called when the university community has reached consensus on a particular issue. In this case, there has been no consensus there has been no consensus from all constituencies and particularly no agreement from the protesting students that the academic program will continue on Monday. To note, note again, we had agreed with everybody else that we'd go through the General Assembly, we'd march, we'd declare support, and I'll read that out in a minute, but that we would open on Monday, begin the resumption of the academic program. All constituencies agreed to that, except the protesting students. The vast majority of staff and the vast majority of students also wanted that. The protesting students effectively wanted the General Assembly, and they wanted the march to the Constitutional Court to continue. But they refused to commit that the academic program will commence on Monday, as previously we had discussed. One of the latest demands of the protesting students is that BITS and all other universities should be shut down until government agrees to free education. Effectively, they were prepared to sacrifice the 2016 academic program. In addition, there has been no agreement from the protesting students on the format of the General Assembly. 
effectively a general assembly, as we've enunciated before, is chaired by our chancellor. We read a pledge. All of the constituencies declare support of the pledge on whatever the major issue is. In this case, they didn't agree to that format and wanted direct engagement from the floor. Our concern in this regard is that it may create unnecessary tension between students themselves and between some students and other stakeholders, raising important security risks and serving as a symbol for disunity for the university. General Assembly is meant to be a symbolic reflection of unity. And in this case, if they were not prepared to do so, it would serve as a symbol of disunity. There was also the risk that the safety and security of those attending the General Assembly today cannot be guaranteed. Effectively, if somebody said, stood up and said, I refuse to go back, there would be others that would contest it, and we would not be able to guarantee safety in the tensions that would emerge after that. Therefore, we will postpone the General Assembly until consensus is reached and the conditions for such an assembly are met. We remain committed to the pledge and the march, and should conditions enable this, we would be happy to proceed. Again, I want to read that. We remain, we will postpone the General Assembly until consensus is reached and the conditions for such an assembly are met. We remain committed to the pledge and the march, and should conditions enable this, we would be happy to proceed. The university has dedicated many resources in preparation for this major event, in ne including negotiating the pledge that was to be read out today, ensuring the availability of important and key role players, and even sacrificing another week of lectures. We thank the mediators for their time, their patience, and their insight in their attempts to reach consensus on a matter of national importance. They spend countless hours trying to obtain consensus from all constituencies this week. A council meeting will be called this weekend, after which a way forward for the university will be determined. We regret any inconvenience caused to any individual as a result of this decision. This is a decision of the senior executive team as of this morning at 8.30. Perhaps, Tawana, I should uh, read the pledge so that colleagues have an idea what the pledge we were prepared to make a commitment on. And then we should open up. Is that OK? So the pledge that we were prepared to come to terms with, and this had been the focus of the negotiations. The university, and this would have been read at the General Assembly, the University of the Witwatersrand holds the General Assemblies at crucial times in South Africa's history. We are gathered here today in order to present a united university position with the aim of contributing to resolving South Africa's ongoing higher education crisis. The WITS community agrees that free, fully funded, quality, decolonized higher education is possible. We are committed to finding effective measures to achieve this goal. Read it again. This is what the university community was going to read. The WITS community agrees that free, fully funded, quality decolonized higher education is possible. We are committed to finding effective measures to achieve this goal. South African education, including higher education, is in a systemic crisis. It is a crisis that is born of our colonial and apartheid history, but has been exacerbated by poor policy choices in the post-apartheid era. Since 1994, South Africa has been growing its higher education system, expanding the student base from 420,000 to just over 1 million. Yet the per capita subsidy for higher education has declined in real terms. This has forced universities to increase fees, 
in an effort to maintain quality. The net effect has been to price high education outside the hands of ordinary South Africans. This is a systemic challenge that has to be addressed, in part because it will enable us to heal our fundamental divides, including the poverty and inequality of our society. Education and higher education are a mechanism through which to draw individuals, families and communities out of the poverty trap and to provide people with opportunities to fully participate in society and the economy. It is a basis on which to heal and create an inclusive society. The quest to enable access to universities for all of our students is a noble cause. The University of the Witwatersrand therefore pledges our support for the goal of free, fully funded, quality, decolonized higher education. We pledge to approach government with a united voice for the realization of this goal. We pledge to deploy our intellectual resources towards finding the best solutions towards this goal. We are also prepared to support peaceful advocacy activities in this regard. Ultimately, our efforts will be part of creating a new educational pact for South Africa that will be based on a single principle. No student should be prevented from continuing and completing their studies because of a lack of finance. That was the pledge that this entire university community was prepared to make at this university assembly. Our simple request was the resumption of the academic program for 2016. I assert again, the struggle for free education is a noble cause, but it is not a cause that requires the sacrifice of the 2016 academic year. Too many students, in Witz's case, 37,000 students, would not proceed, and that would be a tragedy of enormous proportions. And that's the decision that effectively we made. So I'll stop there and hand over back to Tawana. Thank you very, very much. So we'll take questions, ladies and gentlemen. I think I'll try and take them in batches of three. Let's be considerate of each other and not uh, give each other space. Kriselda. Uh, good morning. I'm Kriselda Lewis from SABC Television News. Uh, are we look I know that you're going to meet, uh, the council's going to meet over the weekend, but are we looking at the high possibility of this institution shutting down for the remainder of the year? Second question, very brief. We see that uh, police have also now made their way onto the premises. Is this a decision that uh, this university has now taken to redeploy, to redeploy police onto the premises, perhaps over fear that students might go on the rampage again? So, okay, do we want to take other questions? Colin uh, Gandhi from ENCA. Um, just a few questions, um, VC. First one is, what was the sticking point? What is it that the students could not agree on with you? Um, second, there is a question, even on social media, people are saying, why isn't the Vice Chancellor down at the steps. I'm frightened of the students and linked to that question, VC, how do you respond to criticism from someone like Lehaburu Mahova, who was a vice chancellor for about 12 years in KZN, who has basically almost slammed all of the vice chancellors in the country, saying that you have not built relationships with your students. You, in a way, have remained aloof. Okay, we'll answer, you answer those questions, then I'll take another round. Okay, and then colleagues, if you want to come in, please feel free to come in. So let me kick off with Chriselda's question. Is there a high possibility for shutting up the year? Uh, as I said, the council will meet. But our intention, it has been for the last 10, 15 days, it has been this entire year, and it will continue to be to save the academic program of 2016. That is the single biggest focus of our attention. You would have seen some very unfortunate remarks made by all kinds of people over the last couple of days. 
against me and against my colleagues. Some scurrilous remarks. But we've not at once, we've tried to correct it, but we haven't responded to that. Because our single focus has been that we want to save the academic year. We want 27 or 37,000 students to graduate, to pass their year, or to grad the five or 6,000 to graduate. That is our single, single focus. And I can tell you, it will be the single, single focus of this council meeting. So we have not thrown in the towel and saying, we are going to close. But we are going to look at all of the options and see what is the best way to save the academic year. And that's what we will do. We have looked at the issue of police. Uh, as you know, we had already said that the police would be at the perimeter for the last couple of days. They have been. We have deployed them uh, effectively uh, at, at one part of the university community. So that if we, we, we had a problem because if we simply put all of them at the perimeter, they would have blocked the roads. So we put them in, in a certain part of the university community and, if you like, kept them out of the mainstream of the university life. And as uh, this morning, we will be taking security measures to ensure if there's a risk, then they will be deployed. But as of now, we're looking at that, 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 that situation to make sure that we protect the risks, uh, the university's property, uh, and the safety of everybody in the university. What is the sticking point? I said to you, the, the statement makes it fairly clear. There were two sets of uh, sticking points. The first is there was no commitment to starting the academic year. There was no commitment to beginning on Monday. That was the singular focus. We said, we, we're open to the idea, but we are committed to saving the academic year and beginning on Monday. And in fact, we hadn't got that commitment about beginning on Monday, but even more so, a circular that was released sometimes four o'clock this morning say, that said the following from Fees Must Fall. The university should officiate the shutdown until the government of South Africa makes a commitment to legislate free decolonized education for all now. Essentially what they were saying is if there's no free education, there should be no education at all. That's what they say in that statement. And it's something that we just could not agree. We have been honest from day one. This university has said we are committed to working with these protesters on free education, but we are not committed to losing the 2016 academic year. And that's what effectively that said. So that was the first. The second was effectively the format of that assembly. The assembly is the symbol of unity. As I said, you read a pledge, it's chaired by the chancellor, Everybody declares, all of the constituencies declare support. And then we were planning to sign this pledge and walk after that, march to the Constitutional Court as a university community with the vice chancellor in academic and the academics in academic regalia to show the symbolism of the university, to show that we are committed to that. What they wanted to do is raise, change that format and enable effectively engagement from the floor. There was no guarantee that there wouldn't be disruptions of one kind or the other. And our fear was some students will stand up and say, we refuse to open. And we're saying this. And as you know, other students who came here because they're assuming a consensus will say, but what do you mean you're not opening? And there would be tension and that it would dis erupt into violence and we were not in a position. To do that, not only will it be a sign of disunity, our fundamental purpose is to guarantee the safety and security of all. And if we can't guarantee that safety and security, are we not risking something that we should not be risking? One of the choices we made when we spoke to the mediators on Wednesday, on Tuesday night, we will take one more, one more plunge in trying to find a negotiated outcome to avoid the possibility of fatalities of somebody getting truly hurt. That's the same logic that had to prevail in our decision. Did we see this as a public relation problem? Yes. You know, I, somebody who engages, my colleagues are people who engage the media. We saw the problem. We saw the, the significance of this decision and how it could be read by the university and the, and the South African community. But we said, do we take this risk? 
And for that reason, we said we can't afford to. We can't guarantee that. And so that's the thing that we, we looked at. You said something about why aren't I down there? Yeah. So let me answer this, because I've seen this on, <coughs> on, on, on Twitter, and I've seen it. People have made this. We said a couple of things. The first is we wrote last week a letter to the SRC and said, could we negotiate? I, we are prepared to negotiate. Please choose your leaders so that we can engage in a negotiated outcome and find a solution to this. When the students took in, tried to interdict the poll at the courts, as the case was playing out, a student leader and I walked out and I made the approach and I said, whatever the outcome of this poll, please let's come to a negotiated outcome and a solution to this. I am open to this. My colleagues are open to this. On Saturday, last week, when we made this decision, we had some students came to us and said, would you reaffirm your commitment to free education for the poor and the missing middle in that, in that terminology? Reaffirm your commitment to a general assembly. Reaffirm that you're prepared to engage. I know, we know you said that, but could you say it again in, in a bold way and at 12 o'clock on Saturday, we released a statement that, you know, you can check that. Shirona will make that available. They said to us, would you do a phased opening? Start not for everybody on, on Wednesday. And would you move the police to the perimeter? We said, OK, we'll give it one more shot. And on Wednesday, there was harassment and intimidation of staff. They said, on this week, the mediators came and said, would you engage? And we said we'd be open to that idea. What people say to me, why don't you do what you did and engage the students like you did last year? You saw, I spent an entire night. Why did I spend an entire night? Because I recognized about the nobility of a cause. And that entire night I spent, and Randall, my chair of council, and Len was there, and uh, Andrew was there, and a number of us were there. We did it because we saw the nobility of a cause. But what you can go and check that entire night, we were not allowed to speak. All we heard was students make the demands and said, either deliver or not. And engagement is a two-way process. It is not a one-way lecture. And that's something that's worth bearing in mind. And the thing that I was going to say, and I want to say it together, I am prepared to engage. But you can't negotiate in a group of 600. You negotiate when leaders find, they come, you find a solution, and then you move on to engage your constituency. And we've done that. We did it on the, if you like, on the issue of uh, insourcing. We went and addressed the cloud. You saw that. Then we came back, and Tawana led a negotiating team. <clears throat> and once we had an outcome, we went back to the base. We did that. But what is not acceptable is effectively you say you engage, and you want to engage. But what you want to engage in the politics of spectacle? You want to bring the vice chancellor and people there. You don't want to hear and engage them. You want to continue, do a repeat of last year, October 18th, I think, 16th, I think it was. You want the glare of the world's media, but that's not an engagement. We are not into the politics of spectacle. We have to understand, colleagues, that higher education is in a crisis. We are prepared to find solutions. My colleagues and I are prepared to sit down to work every single ounce of energy we have to work with people to find the solution, but to get people back to the academic program so the examinations of 37,000 people is not sacrificed. I'm not replacing that for the politics of spectacle. And so I, I say that because that's the thing. We've been writing letters, if you want, Sharona, will make you all of the letters available that we've sent. 
I've said this before and I said it again. We released it in the statement last week. If any one of you want to check my Twitter account, everything I've been saying is all there on multiple times. So we've communicated this and my colleagues have communicated this. As for Vice Chancellor Malakapuru Makhoba, I think it's an unfortunate thing for him to make statements in a context where he hasn't understood the local issues. So does Malakapuru Makhoba know, in my case, that once a month I meet the, vice, the SRCs? That once a month my colleagues meet the... Uh, once, a, once a month the colleagues meet the unions? Only three or four weeks ago I had a, assembly, a, a university town hall meeting, two of them, where we engaged people. Early on in the year when there was a protest at the education campus, all of us went and engaged all of the students. It's not about being frightened. I've done it before. I've done it again. I've done it in my youth. I've done it last year. I did it in June with my colleagues. I've done it in the General Assembly. But there has to be a point of principle a point of principle that says we are interested, that if you put a set of demands, if we try and meet your demands, there's a give and take. You can't say you give, but we know we never give. We only take. That's what negotiations are about. And I think that we need uh, to look at that. What the demand for the students are, I want to say this again. Free national struggle for free decolonized education now. Now. What they're saying is a complete shutdown, the sacrifice of the 2016 academic year. I've got 37,000 students on this campus, the vast majority of whom have said in Facebook, in Twitter, in polls, everything, <coughs> the academic program must be saved. And so, I don't know how the other vice chancellors will respond, and I think that they must respond on their own. But I think it's incredibly provocative and incredibly dangerous for a leader never to have engaged the vice chancellor, not to have said, what have you done? What have you engaged? Have you engaged? And then make a judgment. You know, I've spoken to Professor Malakapuru Makhoba, a number of times over the last couple of months. But he hasn't phoned me in the last 10 days and said, Adam, what have you done? Have you engaged? Have you made decisions? I think that that's unfortunate. And I'm, I'm disappointed at, 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 at this thing. Finally, Tawana, there was uh, some journalists have asked us to answer what is the sticking point? Again, I'm saying the sticking point is two things. The resumption of the academic year 2016. That's the first sticking point. There was a refusal to look at that. The engagement, and I was reported, some of the mediators left my house at 3 o'clock this morning. We continue to have this engagement from 3 o'clock with my colleagues. Uh, if you look at how harassed I look these days, it's part of the, uh, the sign of not sleeping enough. The second is we couldn't agree on the format of the General Assembly. This General Assembly goes back 60 years. It has a particular format. And the fundamental component of this is, it is the affirmation to the world of, yes, our collective position on a subject. In this case, it would have been free education. What happened in this case is people refused to recognize that format, and there was a threat, effectively, that should we allow the engagement from the floor, there would be a risk that it could create conflict. Because the world is coming to this university, uh, this General Assembly, on the assumption that the consensus has been achieved. That's how they come. The negotiations are successful. We've got the consensus. And if they come, and suddenly there's a reflection that there's no consensus, or at least a part of the consensus, and it becomes a, an argument and a fight, we can't guarantee the safety and security, and on that basis, we couldn't have it. So that's the context of it. I give back to Tawana Cooper. Okay. My voice is going, so may I, my colleagues may answer some of these. Yeah. Questions? 
Ahí hablar está mañana, ¿oye? Ok, then I'll check to sell the entire again. Go ahead. Ok, thank you. No me toque con la AMN7. I'd like to find out, will there be any other kind or any kind of medical arrangement for those who want to continue learning? And also, what what is the cost that the university is bearing when they have to when they have to uh, bring private security to the university? And lastly, do you think that there is a deliberate attempt to stop violence at the university? Okay. Uh, Salda Lewis from SABC Television once again. Um, prior to this announcement, uh, there had been calls by some of these student uh, groups uh, calling uh, for your head, uh, wanting you to resign, uh, Prof. Adam Habib. Uh, we suspect that those calls might rise once again because clearly the students did not get what they want. Would you resign if the situation uh, does not uh, improve? even after the discussions that you'll have with council over the weekend, and it clearly seem that the university had absolutely no choice but to shut down for the academic year, would you resign? Okay, Prof, I'm quite interested to hear when you say, quote unquote, you're not prepared to throw in the towel. BIT must use its chairmanship position, so to speak, uh, with respect to all universities in South Africa, to try and drive this agenda of uh, fees must fall. So you use your position as chair of universities to try and make sure that uh, you drive this message. Is that something that you are prepared to do as a university? So let me answer this. I, I, the question on whether I'm prepared to resign or not, I, I think should be a question answered by my chair, and I give him the opportunity to answer that. Uh, let me answer the private security. We have actually released figures on this thing. Um, we've said before, right from the beginning of this year, we had a cost, and we assumed that it was in the region of about two million per month. We've been able to pull that down slightly over the last couple of months, but obviously in the last 10 days, uh, it's become more hectic, and so we've had to deploy more personnel. Uh, and we've grappled with this issue. You know, I've said I, on a debate this past weekend, I think it was on ENCA with one of the student leaders, I said, I think that the university community would be prepared to pull back on police and private security in exchange for a public commitment of three, four things. No violence, no arson, no disruption of the academic program, and if any individual violates that, they can be suspended and you support them. They said, we can't give you that commitment. Now, we've had a threat of somebody trying to burn a library. We do know that there's been multiple institute buildings burnt in universities around this country, over a billion rand. We do know that we had a bus burnt in February earlier in the year with students on it who had to get out. We do know that there have been disruptions in the program. If we don't have private security and somebody dies or a building is burnt, will you not hold us responsible? And so this is not an executive management decision, and my, co my chair will speak to this in a minute, and my others, the chair of, of our FINCO is here. We've debated this extensively in council. We understand the implications. The question we ask is do we lose the two million a month, or do we run the risk of was wasting and losing 100 million building in the process. Are we prepared to sacrifice that? Worse, are we prepared to sacrifice a life because we didn't have appropriate security in place? Are there people, uh, are we doing continuing learning? I told you our fundamental purpose is to save the academic program. That's what our focus will be. That's what we are looking at scenarios with. And that's what we will be engaging our council in the coming hours and in the, over the weekend. Do we think that there are some people who are stoking violence? I must say, we have had some violence, some intimidation. We saw that on Monday. We saw that on Tuesday. But we haven't had any burnings. We have had some attempts earlier on. But we have had some disquieting uh, uh, incidents. We have found some Molotov cocktails early on, I think 10 days ago, uh, etc. I've, I've, I'll come back to some of the allegations around that. I know that some people say, that I brought it wine bottles from New York to actually create the Molotov cocktails and leave it there. Now, 
I mean, is that rational? I mean, you ask yourself, is that rational? Even if that were half true, why would I bring it from New York uh, if you can get alcohol in this country? Uh, on the issue of, uh, I said we won't throw in the top. You know, I will, I'll come back, I'll come back to that last, but we, our focus is the academic program. That's what we're going to focus on. And that's what we're going to do this thing. Will I use my position as chair of USEF? You know, as USEF chair, I am merely a representative of 26 vice chancellors. I reflect their view. When I spoke at the Imbizo, I reflected their collective position. Now, there is a difference of opinions every now and then, yes. But every one of those vice chancellors in the USEF office has been dedicated in the last six to eight weeks to find the solution. And we've been grappling with it. My colleagues in every other university have been grappling with it. And am I prepared to use my position? Absolutely. But I use my position as, a as part of a collective. I'm not some Adam Abib who transcends 26 vice chancellors. I am a part of a community of 26 vice chancellors, all of whom are grappling with finding a solution collectively to the challenges that we all confront in our institutions and to the, this thing. I'll say this, by the way. Every one of the student leaders know and have said that WITS and every other of these universities can't resolve this problem. We are in no position to declare free education. This is a systemic decision. That can't happen. And so we ask again, why do you sacrifice our academic program and those of the other universities if you know that we cannot deliver on this thing? We are prepared to work with you. We are prepared to engage you. I even said earlier on we were prepared to have a general assembly and march with you around this. A final thing I'll say and hand over to my chair. Am I prepared to resign? I'll say two things. I, I haven't responded to this earlier, but I'll respond now. There's been some terrible things said about myself. I've not responded to it. There's been things said I, I own 37% of a company. I said, go check it. I'm not getting involved in this thing, but you can check it. Somebody came to me and asked me, and I said, I think our head of communication said, we say that this is not right. I think it was Cesar Gobordo and Insel Saluba who had actually done our audit. I said, check it. If I own 37%, if I would it not be Cesar and Saluba, Gobordo and Habib? But I don't own any of these things. Scurrilous remarks. I've heard people say things about my family. Scurrilous. I have a situation where effectively people say I'm a thief without putting a single ounce. You know, I lead a public institution. I recognize that there is a, a commitment that public officials like myself, people who lead public institutions, must be held accountable. Everything I've done has been in the public domain including my salaries and everything else. I'm, a, I'm prepared to be held accountable. <clears throat> but what I think must be done is the issue of principle. If you make an accusation, you must be able to put some evidence on the table. You don't make an accusation without any cause. There is a fundamental principle. Politics in our society must not be about spectacle. It must be about principle. Because it is only through principle that we can find the solutions to our society. So you ask the question, from my side, I have been appointed by a council, and the council will speak in a minute. But I will say this, I have never in my life, in the midst of a position, because I confronted a challenge, say, I'm going to run away. That's not the way I this thing is. In 18 months, I think 16 months, my contract ends. And the council and the university community will have a right to make that determination. They have that right. And I've always said, if I don't have the confidence of the Senate and the council, I won't stand. Because that's who employs me. But the decision that will I resign now because we have all of these challenges, that would be abrogating a responsibility that I made not only to the Senate and Council, but to a nation. 
and that's not what I've done in my life and it's not what I would want to do. But anything else around that, about my employment, about all of those issues, it seems to me is a fundamental question of my counsel. And perhaps the chair should answer in that regard. Thanks, um, thanks uh, <coughs> Vice Chancellor. Yeah. You see, I'm getting PR lessons from the VC. <laughs> um, from council's perspective, we are. I just have to to re-emphasize and uh, accentuate what the VC said. The the option of losing 2016 is actually not an option. The consequences are too ghastly to contemplate. It has not been costed yet economically or socially. But that simply cannot happen. We have a responsibility to parents, we have a responsibility to our society, we have a responsibility to South Africa to make 2016 happen. And we have, and we still will, together with Council, investigate any ways. And we will actually have to think out of the box to come up with ways to make sure that most, if not all, our students complete this year satisfactorily. So we are utterly committed to that. It's actually not even featuring in our thoughts about sacrificing this year. Uh, we have been working very closely with management. This council has been very, very close to management. And I would like to publicly recognize the superhuman effort the people around this table have gone to, the sacrifices they made in their personal lives, the professionalism that they continue to display throughout uh, is actually a tribute to the quality of leadership that we have in our education system. It is very easy to shout from the outside to question certain decisions, but in the heat of the moment you have to make decisions that you think is best at that particular point. Do we have confidence in, in the Vice Chancellor and, and the senior leadership? Absolutely. And this confidence is not born out of any romantic notion. It's, it's, it's supported by facts. Under Professor Biff's leadership, this university has grown in some of the world rankings and certainly is the leading university on the African continent. It is a proof throughput of student students and that has significantly improved on our uh, uh, subsidy allocation. Our strategic plan of growing our postgraduate outputs have improved. I think uh, if I'm correct, uh, we see that the ratio is at the, at the moment 50 percent of our students are, are going into the, the uh, postgraduate. Uh, well, the aim is 50 percent, but we are 35 percent of our students are at postgraduate level and our aim is to get to 50 percent. But overall, if you speak to any one of our stakeholders, and you speak to parents, and you speak to students, and you speak to our international counterparts, the bits degree continue to carry considerable currency. And certainly it has international portability. You can go anywhere in the world with a bits degree. And we, as council, are hugely protective of that. So our job as council is to make sure that this university is going to be around for future generations that continue to generate the levels and, and quality of output that it's generating now. And we are acutely aware of the limited time that this university is under our stewardship. And we are not going to renege on that responsibility. So the VC will stay until his contract is finished. And we will talk about the renewal of his contract soon, soon in the near future. Utter confidence, utmost confidence. And I want to thank my colleagues on council. The amount of time that these professionals have spent at this institution with zero pay is also has to be commendable. So any, any notion of us getting paid, there is no pay. We're not getting paid for this job. We do it for the love of this country and for the sacrifice that we made to establish this democracy. Okay, yes. Okay, um, I'm just wondering if you agree uh, with the government that a third force is behind uh, these protests, or do you genuinely oh, think that it is a cause driven by the students? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Just to follow up on my colleague's question, is there any pressure from government to close the institution or on a way forward? Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, Mr. Nicole. Uh, Mr. Trump, Mr. Nicole. I just wanted to, um, see, you said that the university had become aware that the thesis for this has been there are, um, there are claims that you guys got information from the Department of Higher Education. Can you just clarify how you were made aware of this, uh, the students? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, you, can you uh, repeat your question from the beginning? I couldn't okay. hear what you said. Um, so earlier you said that you were made aware of the students' um, utterances that you, they only want the quality education and they want it now, which goes against 
the AMOC meeting in public meetings. There are um, claims that this was uh, brought to your attention by the Department of Higher Education and specifically the Minister. Can you just clarify how you became aware of this information? Okay. So, I, so uh, again, uh, the third force, I, I, I've heard this argument, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I, my approach to this, and I think my colleague's approach to this, is any social struggle has multiple interests and multiple actors. And sometimes, sometimes those actions and those actors have conflicting demands. But I don't believe the crisis of higher education is being perpetuated and created by some external agency. I think there is a legitimacy to this cause. We've said this before. We think that there's a structural challenge in our higher education system where the subsidies have declined to the point where we've had to increase fees and higher education has begun to be priced out. And that is at the core of the challenge. Now, are there individuals that may very well have uh, agen other agendas? Probably. I've never seen a single social movement where other agendas, small agendas, don't conflict with what the major issue is. But if you're asking, is this the higher education crisis a manufactured crisis by some external agency to the student community? I don't believe that. And I believe that what we need to do is try and resolve the fundamental challenge uh, that we face. I don't think that that fundamental challenge, I think in resolving it, you're going to have to find short, medium-term, and long-term plans. And I think you need to think through short, medium, and long-term plans, and it requires will, it requires imagination, and it requires all sides to be pragmatic enough to understand you can't get everything immediately. That you have to win some things, you have to consolidate it, you need to work towards a goal. And get all sides to start singing from the same hymn sheet. And unfortunately, we're not getting enough of all sides singing from the same hymn sheet at this particular moment. And it seems to me that that's the big challenge. Uh, there was the question asked, uh, of, of the Power FM asked a question, I'm trying to remember, what was it? Uh, just if you're taking pressure to close, and okay, the yes. So, look, we I've had conversations with obviously my colleagues here, and our council. My bad conversations with other vice chancellors, understanding their challenges and we our challenges, and I've had conversations with uh, officials at the Department of Higher Education and Training, and we've explored and engaged on multiple issues. We've uh, discussed what options there very well may be. Uh, but I think the Department of Higher Education and Training is very clear that the decision on whether BITS closes or opens is a decision of its council. That's who makes this decision in consultation with its Senate. We do this decision. So yes, we engage, we learn, we hear what they say, we hear all of those things as we do everybody else. And then we deliberate on those issues and make those decisions and inform them. So am I in conversation, and are my colleagues in conversation with the officials in the Department of Education? Yes, as is my chair of council. But does that mean that we taking instructions? No. We basically, I think, officials in the Department of Education are very, very mindful of the challenges that exist and that this decision has to be made by us. Uh, the final question is, there was this thing that, how did you find out what the, the fees must fall and said, if I think, and did I hear it from the minister? No, I haven't spoken to the minister. And if you're asking, did I hear it from the department? No, I haven't heard it from the department. I got it because it's on social media. It was released at 4 o'clock. It says at the bottom there, fees must fall. There's no counter response saying that it's not us. Uh, it was brought to my attention by our communications team. And it has a, a statement there. It's not uh, none of what's said there, except one or two things. But the idea of uh, you know shut down uh, until the government makes of South Africa makes a commitment is something that I've heard from leaders directly when I've engaged them, uh, and it's what others have in, have engaged. So it's not foreign to what we've been hearing for some time. So I have not spoken. We never got this from anybody else. 
except through communication that has been made available through social media and other communication channels. Uh, in fact, this was brought to my attention by our head of communications, and she brought it and said, yes, what, what was released. So we're going to close now. I'm taking one last one. Toji, Chris, and yourself. Uh, 